Hello there, folks, and welcome to TK Live for Thursday, June the 8th. We got uh, all three Elmers in the studio tonight to talk about some pickup trucks. So uh, what do we do here on TK Live? We like to get in the studio uh, every other week, and we like to talk about pickup trucks, specifically truck news. We comb through all the news, talk about what's new on the market, talk about what we've been up to, what's coming on the channel, some things we've done on the channel. And you know what? There was actually a bunch of news this time, guys. I went combing through, and we have a couple pretty decent news stories to talk about tonight. It was a busy week for trucks. Yeah, it was a, it, surprisingly so. Not like huge headlines, but a bunch of interesting stories. However, the stories that you're kind of expecting, because, of course, particularly this year, with all the new mid-sized trucks getting refreshed, one of the questions that kept coming up is, are we going to get a Maverick competitor? Okay, everybody knows what Maverick's been doing, and we hear from you guys all the time about how tough it is to get a Maverick. So yeah. we've been fielding those questions for months. Yeah. Is blank brand going to bring out a Maverick competitor? Is blank brand going to bring out a competitor? And hence, that's where the news starts. So, Steve, so we start with the Ram. So, and and, and we'll talk. We'll talk about what Ram is teasing, but let's start with the fact that all of this truck news about these compact trucks is coming out of Brazil. Brazil has a very sp strong truck market, especially a small truck market. So both the trucks we're about to talk about are all coming from Brazil. And a public access uh, patent office. <laughs> well, this is actually teasers from okay. the brand, not okay. like the Toyota thing. <laughs> um, so anyways, the first one is the new or, or rebirth of the Ram Rampage. I'll pull up the teaser right here. So there it is. I mean, it's barely a teaser. They're basically showing us off the entire truck. It's a small unibody Ram. This is going to be a Maverick competitor that comes from Ram. And I think, again, right now they've only announced it for Brazil. They have not confirmed it for North America. There are some sources, including The Drive uh, online, thedrive.com. They say they, it's coming. They have an inside source. But the point is, it's confirmed for Brazil, but just look at it. That is a North American-style truck. Yeah, I was about to say, that's North American ready. Yeah. And so long as the underpinnings work as far as, uh, you know, NITS is concerned, then yeah, why not? Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. You can almost look at it and just have an eye for it. They obviously knew that this thing wasn't just going to stay in Brazil. It was going to come here. So it just looks like it's, it's ready for North America. And, and you said it about Maverick. Not only is it super popular, but they can't build enough. So the first brand to jump into that space is going to clean up. And so they're, they're working on it. So yes, yeah, exactly. Good to see what Ram is doing. And if you do want a sense for how big that thing is, uh, they say it shares its underpinnings with the Jeep Compass. So that's, and that's very pretty much small. Maverick size. Relatively speaking, yeah. But, yeah. but pretty small. Definitely pretty small. Um, so that's definitely interesting from Ram. Cool to see the Rampage name coming back. And I will remind you guys, yes, there was a Dodge Rampage. Here it is. That's a 1982 Dodge Rampage. This is before Matthew and Mai's time, but Dad remembers these. I remember jobs. these, and uh, that's back in those days, Chrysler was uh, big in bed with Mitsubishi. Mm. And if memory serves, a lot of what you see there was uh, was a Mitsubishi underneath. Yeah, I think you're right. But what a weird-looking little truck. Just wow. Well, weird little flat Like I said, <laughs> dude, it was the 80s. It was new wave. Yeah, they're doing weird <laughs> stuff. But I looked that thing up. The Rampage name was rattling around somewhere in the back of my brain, but when I looked it up, I was like, I don't remember ever seeing those. I don't think they're around they never sold. They never sold very many. Yeah. So there you go. Ram Rampage is coming back. It's cool to see them uh, looking into it. Now, the other truck out of Brazil that I expect we will see up here in North America is the Chevrolet Montana. So they revealed the new Montana hmm. about three or four months ago now. And no, again, for all of you saying, that's a minivan. Yeah. No. That's, in other that's parts where of, my brain went. In wow. other parts of the world, Montana's been a pickup truck for hmm. many years. Only here in, in Canada and, and the U.S. did they use that name yeah. badge on a minivan. Well, and briefly, because it's been gone for a while. So there you go. So, uh, so the new Montana, and I will pull up a photo of it right here so you guys can see what we're talking about. There it is. That's the Chevy Montana. Once again, it looks like a perfect little Maverick competitor. Well, that's, that's chunky. Built, built on a blazer or a trailblazer by the looks of it. Uh, yeah, I believe it's the trailblazer, the yeah. smaller one. Um, and and again, it, it, it's unibody and it looks to be very North American styled. It looks like yeah. the North American cars, like a yeah. Camaro or a bit of Silverado. Yeah. Um, so I think just with that, it's pretty obvious that this is probably going to not stay in Brazil. And yeah. It, yeah. Now, the other thing to remember for, for those of us, of course, who've never been to Brazil, 
um, or many other parts of the world, is that the rest of the world looks at these as trucks, full stop, just trucks, because they don't have half tons yeah, like we do. The big stuff. They yeah. don't have half tons. So for them, a, a Toyota Hilux, uh, you know, a.k.a. Tacoma, that is their full-size truck. So for them, this is just another variant, and they don't consider this to be any kind of a, a compact. And quite frankly, they will do really well around the world with trucks of this size. Um, it's amazing to see what guys in, when I was in South America, can cram into these little trucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. what well, we consider small trucks, right? <clears throat> um, so there's two things. The first thing, actually, we got to talk about, we might as well hit it right now. The one problem with the Brazilian trucks is the chicken tax. If they're built in Brazil and they're shipped to North America from South America, they get hit with the chicken tax, which I believe is 25% of tax added on to every pickup truck built. You cannot build pickup trucks abroad and ship them here. So that's the one thing both Chevy and Ram are going to have to find American, Canadian, or Mexican production hmm. for both of these things. They're not just going to ship them up from Brazil. So there's one little hiccup there that, that's worth mentioning. Yeah, except it's not really a big one, only because Brazil... Uh is one of the few countries in South America that does have auto plants. And this actually mm -hmm. goes all the way back to the early 20s when Ford and Chevy first went down there. And the Brazilians were one of the few people who said, if you want to sell here, you got to build here. So they have a very, very strong, you know, quote unquote, domestic truck market because they've got plants. Yeah. Uh, no other countries in South America have auto plants. Hmm. So... I think Mexico, Mexico is your answer because of That's NAFTA. Right. Yeah, of course. Yes. Right? Because yeah. they can they can they can move this into Mexico, build them there. Plants already exist, and then yeah. because and of then NAFTA, the there's no issue. Hmm. Or there was the classic one where Ford was building, I believe it was Transit Connects, and putting seats in them to sell them as passenger vans, shipping them in, and then ripping the seats out and selling them as commercial vans because they were getting around, around the, the chicken tax. That was the original gag behind <coughs> Subaru Brat. Yeah. Okay, Adding which the is seats. they threw the seats in the back, so therefore it wasn't a pickup truck, and they got around the chicken tax. Yeah, that's funny. Hmm. Uh, so the only other thing I want to mention, because I think it's pretty cool, is this uh, Chevy Montana has this really cool modular bed system where there's all kinds of these different storage shelves. So you can see it there by itself. And then I'll bring up this next photo. So those that storage rack can get folded right into the walls of the truck, and then all of a sudden you have kind of an open bed. And then you can also do this and have the twin rack and hold up all your stuff. And they say there's an integrated tonneau cover that's watertight that'll get wrapped over there. And you can get an optional hard top tonneau straight from, uh, straight from Chevy. So the bed just looks really cool. It looks like they really focused on making it... Uh, they did some work there. Yeah, making it very useful for a million different little things. Yeah, it's cool. So yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. So Chevy Montana and Ram Rampage, I mean, it feels like they're definitely coming. When are they coming is a big question. I would be surprised if it was any later than 2024. We Maybe late this year, but uh -huh. if we don't see them by next year, then there's they're, a problem. They're chasing but, Ford and... And to a much lesser extent, Hyundai. Hyundai, sure. Because you, you got to get it to market. They can see how good those products are doing. So I think it's just, a, you know, champing at the bit, got to get it out there. Sure. Now, on the same heel, on the same, with, in the same vein as these uh, midsize trucks, we actually got a good question, or pardon me. Sure, yeah, compact. let's answer some. What do you guys think of all the compact trucks that are coming out, including the Maverick, that are unibodies? Would there be a market for a, a you know, he says ladder on frame, I'm assuming he meant body on frame. Sure. And more support for off road purists in this market. I want to go right away and say no. I would say no. I want to too. say in this compact truck market, we're we're bringing out products that people can just buy and use. If you're into that kind of stuff, you're going to buy the things that are out there, the Jeeps, yeah, Wrangler. The, the Wrangler, the Rangers, the Tacomas. They exist already. If that's what you're going for, they're there. We're not trying to create another sub-genre of off-roader that is now then going to start inflating the prices again. I'm just going to say it. No, it's that's fair. what we're trying to avoid If here. these companies were bringing out entire lineup of vehicles on small frames, so you had multiple bodies on the same frame, of course, but that's not what they're doing. They're going unibody, and they're basing multiple vehicles off these unibody architectures. <coughs> so the answer is no. We'll never get a small, proper frame pickup truck. And, and again, yeah, there's so few usage cases... 
I really, in, in day-to-day use, I don't think you notice it. This You mentioned it, the commenter who said, it's about off-roading. It's about beating the crap out of your vehicle. A frame is going to yeah. be a little bit better. Yeah. But that's a pretty extreme usage case. And how much do you really have to and be beating on it? Exactly. Just so, such a narrow market yeah. slice that it's doubtful that a company is going to devote that much money to building something yeah. like that. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, they'll, I mean, they'll give you stuff. Like Ford came out with the Tremor version of the Maverick already. It sure. exists. Yeah, so I it's mean, not horrible. They're going to give you little bits here and there that if you're the guy that needs to go down a logging road, you're good. Yeah, <laughs> but no, size-wise, the smallest stuff you're going to get with the frame is going to be a Wrangler, a Bronco, a 4Runner. Yeah. All right, well, we can get into our next piece of news unless you want to talk, take some other questions real quick, man. Oh, that one, just because just we were talking about those trucks came up right away. Sure. Um, the rest I'm going to leave for the end because we're really varied tonight. Everybody's talking about different stuff. Okay, that's fine. Well, let's hit you guys with our next piece of news, which is pretty cool, and that is the F700 performance packages from Ford. So, the F FP700, sorry, that's Ford Performance 700. These packages, you can get it in two different flavors. There's the Bronze Edition. That's the truck that you guys are looking at there, right there. Or there is the Black Edition, which is this truck right here. And not only do they bring along some styling, some it's wheels, red. that's some called graphics. the black edition. Well, it's red. It's, yeah, but it's got black wheels and black <laughs> graphics on it. Oh, man. <laughs> Anyways, I thought, I, I thought you put up the wrong photo. No, no, that's the correct <laughs> photo. Uh, black edition, bronze edition. It's some styling stuff. It's wheels. It's tires. But at the heart of the package is a three-liter Whipple supercharger, which is attached onto the five-liter V8, and it puts out 700 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of. Pork. So if you already own a 2021 through 23 F-150 with the 5 liter, you can now go out and get yourself 700 horsepower, which is absolutely insane. So you guys are going to laugh again. This is a picture of the bronze edition. Okay, it's blue. I know it's blue, <laughs> Okay, but it gets the bronze accent. Yeah, it's all about the accents yeah. that come on it, uh, like I said, and the way it looks. But I'll show you the coolest looking one. Is this one right here? The little shorty short bed with those yeah, wheels and with, the style. With the regular cab and seven hundred horsepower. Yeah, you don't thing. see too many of those. Oh, that thing would be crazy. Oh my gosh! So I'll hit you with the price now, and it, it actually doesn't seem too outlandish to me. Um, for the package for the bronze or the black edition, you're talking twelve thousand three hundred dollars U.S. It's a lot, but it's also the way it looks. Like I mentioned, wheels, tires. There's a lowering kit, so there's a couple things that go into Does it. Does it say well. in there that you have to start with a minimum trim? Could, um, I, could I could I get an LT with a five liter and add twelve grand performance package and just go? Well, it's funny you bring that. That's up. actually kind of cool. No, it's funny you bring that up. I did specifically look into that because they do list it. So yes, if you're going for the black addiction, you can get an XL, an XLT, a Larry. Okay. Wow, or that's platinum. cool. If you can start with an XL, yeah, yeah. now you've four, got value. Four by two or four by four doesn't matter. Yeah. Red cab, super cab, or super crew. All the beds, all cabs, you can't have pro power on board or an eight foot bed. There's okay. your your There's your limit. Okay. But that's not much. I mean, really. You're not you're not, you don't need an eight foot bed and seven hundred horsepower. Well nor so. would you. Yeah. So but that's that's, that's pretty cool. That's cool. That's actually really useful. I just want to jump out and say Mr. Sam Wolf gave us two bucks. Thanks, Sam. Hey, appreciate you, Sam. Hey. Watching from Washington tonight. Howdy. Oh, hello, Thank to, you. hello to Washington. <laughs> Um, so let me just also throw in 12 grand for the packages, but I said the packages come with the styling stuff. If you just want the supercharger, $9,500 US just for the supercharger on your five liter yeah. to get it up to 700 horsepower and three year warranty. And that's the big deal, right? You're getting yeah, 700 okay. horsepower with a warranty as long as the work is done at a dealership, of course, but still that's I the tell you, That's what you call a sleeper. You yeah. get just the supercharger yeah, without all Excel. with all without all the fancy uh, paint bits, and uh, you just wipe somebody out at the line. <laughs> yeah. man. holy uh, crap! Uh, yeah, that's crazy, right? Uh, one last little bit here is there are no Canadian prices. 
because as with all Ford performance parts, Canadian mm. dealers order directly from the U.S., which I didn't know. Yes. So I guess that we just pay straight conversion on whatever the U.S. You yeah. hope. Yeah. You're right. I hope. <laughs> We're probably getting marked up here. I'm again. sure. <laughs> but, hey, that's, that's cool news, man. That's 700 horsepower, another 700 horsepower truck, but it feels a little more attainable than a TRX, than a Raptor. Mm. Because that XL with the five liter, you probably get mid thirties. Yeah. And then add nine grand for the supercharger, you could get a forty five thousand dollar seven hundred horsepower factory warranty truck. That's, yeah. I'm, I'm into that. Oh, that's that's, that's a cool package. Right? Well, well done for. Yeah. My, okay. my, my fear when you hear these packages is always like, yep, 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 but you got to start with the Larry. Yeah, and that it's always pie in the sky. <laughs> Try again. Pie in the sky, starting at 145 or something. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know? exactly. Yeah. So the fact that you can build that onto an XL, I'm all about that. Yeah, they're swooping in a little bit there and trying to give us more of a, a cheap or affordable performance package. I like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I have... Uh, one more big uh, email question I actually dug really into, so we can get into that, unless you want to read out some more. Well, I just wanted to that. answer this one question, because yeah, Mr. JC has asked this three times, and he's been waiting patiently. Yes. When are we going to test drive the ZR2? And I don't... He didn't specify Silverado or Colorado. It's got to be Colorado. I'm going to assume Colorado. Yeah, because we've been Silverado. Um, so as you probably have seen, if you're on YouTube a lot, uh, the Americans have already driven the ZR2. Yeah. It was just not a Canadian trip, and that happens to us a lot sometimes. So we're up here waiting for Chevrolet Canada to get trucks, and they don't have trucks here yet. We've, we've been told <laughs> August. Yeah. We've been told summer. Actually, summer. We, yeah. we originally, they hinted at July, but that's already too close. That won't happen. Yeah. Um, it's slated to be done somewhere out in Western Canada from the, uh, from what I've heard, but we're also working on, on something else with the GMC Canyon. And really the big holdup right now is they just keep calling up and going, you got to push it back, push it back. Cause the trucks aren't here yet. Yeah. Um, is that because we're getting screwed for allocation? I don't want to think that. I've but seen some. On dealers, lots, and on the road. So there are a couple around in Canada, but they're not at headquarters. Yeah, you know, and that's, you know, being automotive media, we figure we should get everything first. But, you know, when, when a model is scarce, it's not unusual for us to see it go to the dealers because ultimately they go, okay, give it to these idiots to break or actually or get somebody to, some money. to make money with. Is there, so, there's been more than once where we've driven by dealerships and been like, how do they have five of those and we haven't even seen it yet? Yeah. yeah. So we didn't answer your question. However, let's at this point say fall. It'll be this By fall. the fall, we will have driven it. That's, yes. yes. That's, that's fair. But we have been in the AT4X, which you know is basically the exact same besides some interior bits. So you can go watch our AT4X video here on the channel. And Dad and I will talk you through that truck. And like I said, they're basically the exact same. Yeah. But yeah, as soon as we can get into that Colorado, we will. All right. Should I dive into my uh, sure? Well, being that you did, question? being that you did so much work yeah, on it, yeah, I have all these yeah. pages of if, research. If here. anybody else has any questions, feel free to jump in here while Steve's talking. This is a bit of a long one by the looks of it. Just <laughs> it start is. asking. I'll stack them all up, and we'll get to you as soon as he's done. Yeah. And of course, I want to hear your opinions on this too. So. Let's start by saying, if you guys have questions you want us to dig a little deeper into, send them to hey, H-E-Y, mm -hmm. at trucking.ca. That's what Sarah did, and Sarah has a problem. Sarah is an SUV owner who just bought... Pray tell, what is Sarah's problem? <laughs> she just bought a brand new Grand Design Imagine 16 ML. That's a 20-foot long single-axle travel trailer with a 4,800-pound GVWR and a 412-pound tongue weight. So, Sarah has a Chevy Traverse, and she says that she no longer wants her Traverse. She wants to upgrade to something that tows better. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, I can give you a couple more details. I will only be towing maybe five or six times a year, about 400 miles round trip. So not a ton of towing, no mountains, mostly flat. Um, she feels like she needs 6,000 pounds towing capacity, and at 4,800 GVWR, you might want a little more than 5,000. Now, granted, it's not often that we pull travel trailers at their GVWR. They're usually significantly less. Yeah, rarely. Yeah. And so if it's 4,800 GVWR, then the dry is going to be 32. Correct. 
That said, I still specifically looked for SUVs that had tow ratings above 5,000 pounds. Because there's actually not a lot. A lot come in at 5, but then there's a bit of a gap between like 5 and 8,000 when you go from kind of the crossovers up to the full-size SUVs. Yeah. So I was looking for crossovers and SUVs that fit into that little gap right there. Uh, she also mentioned she currently drives a Traverse, which has a 121-inch wheelbase, and then she specifically says that it's 206 inches long, and she doesn't want a vehicle longer than 210 inches, but no shorter than 206. That's so, a very narrow margin. Absolutely. I, I, I think this lady's an engineer. Sarah was giving me lots of details, but I appreciate the details. We often get these questions with very few details, and then it makes it harder for me Watch to Watch the into. best truck. Exactly. <laughs> so I appreciate the details. And then finally, Sarah ends by saying, the only vehicle I think meets my needs is the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. Uh, can you suggest some other vehicles? So I can suggest some others. But let's start on what you already discovered, which is the Grand Cherokee, and specifically the Grand Cherokee L. Now, the L is the long wheelbase version. When you go for the L, you're getting a 121.7-inch wheelbase, which is more than enough for your 20-foot trailer. Uh, a 20 isn't, foot isn't that one inch longer than what she wanted? Uh, that was only in overall length, not wheelbase. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, and for anyone who wants to know this, the general rule of thumb is a 110-inch wheelbase is good for a 20-foot-long trailer. And then as the trailer gets longer, you also need to then get increase your wheelbase. So for her 20-foot trailer, these wheelbases are more than enough. Yeah. Um, the Jeep Grand Cherokee L, if you get it with the V6, can tow 6,200 pounds. If you get it with the V8, it can tow 7,200 pounds. So you already know that that thing's going to feel really good, especially with the long wheelbase, especially with the V8, because you're getting the overkill on the tow rating. Mm. Now, the other thing Sarah mentioned is she prioritizes rear seat cargo. She never has anyone in the third row, but she stores a lot of stuff. So I also grabbed those numbers. Behind the third row, 17 cubic feet in the Grand Cherokee L, and 46 behind the second row. So those are good storage numbers. You'll understand that once I compare them to the other one. Now, finally, the last numbers, which are also important, payload. And let me tell you, I was impressed to see that the Grand Cherokee L gets significantly better payload than the regular Grand Cherokee. If you go for a limited 3.6 liter, you're getting 1,400 pounds of payload. And pr uh, props to Jeep, they list payload by trim. It's not something we see very often. No. They did that here. Mm. So 1,400 pounds of payload, that's good. Sarah, you already probably nailed it with the Grand Cherokee L. It sounds like it meets all of your needs. But now let me go a little further because I dug into some other vehicles here. <laughs> he went down the rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. I did. I'm and trying now, to and now, help. And now he's got to read it because he read it. Bro. <laughs> I'm trying to help. So the next vehicle I came up with is the Kia Telluride Pro X. When they came out with Telluride, they added this new Pro X package, which ups your towing to 5,500 pounds. Now that's a 114-inch wheelbase, so it's significantly smaller than your Grand Cherokee is. That might not feel quite as good. When it comes to cargo, you have 46 cubic feet and 21 cubic feet. So the Telluride actually has a little more cargo and yet a lot less wheelbase. So if cargo is your thing, Telluride might be for you. But the wheelbase means that it's just not going to be as sturdy as that Grand Cherokee. And the numbers aren't as big either. So Kia's an eh. Next, we get to the Ford Explorer. If you go for the 3 liter EcoBoost in the Ford Explorer, you're getting 365 horsepower. That's the most powerful of the group. It's got a 119 inch wheelbase, plenty long, and it'll do 5,600 pounds of towing. Once again, plenty of towing right yeah. there. Now, when you look at the cargo, the Ford Explorer falls down a little bit. Uh, it just doesn't have the space behind the third row to keep up with the other competitors. So if cargo is what you're looking for, Explorer is not for you. The big thing with the Explorer I wanted to point out was that power, 365 horse. You're not getting that anywhere else. So that's pretty cool. And now the final vehicle I came up with, just to kind of compare it, is a Chevy Tahoe. Why not maybe step up into something full size? Because the truth is, a Tahoe has a 120.9 inch wheelbase that's negligibly bigger than these other vehicles, an inch or two bigger. Overall length is 210 inches on the Tahoe, which is as big as she wanted to go. So actually, that fits that number too. And then if you just get the base package with the 5.3 V8, you're talking about 7,700 pounds. Ooh. We both know that a Tahoe with that 4,800-pound GVWR trailer is going to be overkill, but it's going to feel incredible. And then Tahoe, the, it kills the storage wars too. 25 cubic feet behind the third and 72 behind the second. Oh, yeah. So 
it actually sounds, Sarah, like maybe you want to step up into a Tahoe. That was after looking at all these vehicles, I kind of went Grand Cherokee L would work. You're correct. But the Tahoe checks all of your boxes. And like I said, the towing experience is going to be that much more less stressful with that full-size SUV. Hmm. So you can consider those other ones. But at the end of this whole long rant, I land between get the Grand Cherokee L or maybe step up into something slightly bigger and get a Chevy Tahoe. There you go. Okay. So these okay. are the kind well of things. Done. Well done. <laughs> but these are the kind of things I love digging into. This is what we do for a living. So please send us your questions. And Sarah, if you're watching, you know I hope that uh, I hope that helped you out. And let us know what you end up buying. Watch, she's gonna buy something totally different now. You know, no. <laughs> Toyota Grand Highlander. I uh, also wanted to say any midsize truck would be appropriate too, but you didn't mention trucks, so I didn't go there because then I really would have been talking forever. But uh, any midsize truck would also nail most of your criteria as Brand well. Brandon suggests you should get an F three fifty Platinum Dually. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's the the internet always suggests an F three fifty for everything. What but I will I will say, Sarah, good for you for doing the research. You know, and there is a right answer to your question. It's a combination, and you got to figure it out. But as opposed to, I really like this trailer. I bought it. I already have this SUV. I don't know how it's going to work. And you go down the road, and it's awful. Okay? You've anticipated the issues, and you're going about it the right way. Because yep. most people go about it the wrong way. Most people buy the truck realize it tows like crap but then have to justify their purchase so they'll tell you that it's great even though they're sitting there hating it the entire time they're driving uh, that's awesome among fun. other things yes <laughs> and that's the other thing with those vehicles i listed too as she mentioned she doesn't only tows five or six times a year too they're they're perfectly good daily drivers as well like that's the one thing getting a truck sure that's a bit of a different experience but just getting a grand cherokee sure. L, that's a great commuting vehicle too right so I just wanted to do something, guys, if, if I can get a, uh, a minute or two. Do it. Because Sarah's question actually brought up something <coughs> that we've been working on. The last installment of my ongoing towing videos with my Ram uh, 2500, uh, in which I explained my recent 6,000-mile trip down south and about how... My numbers all added up, but the thing drove like crap, so I titled it, I was wrong. Now, a lot of people have come back, and we are overwhelmingly getting responses where guys are very concerned that overweight has something to do with their insurance company denying them claims if something were to happen. That's... Myth number one. The second one is the guys who come and say the weight police, be that <laughs> um, the actual on-road cops or, or DOT or I don't know, the little green hornet, you know, is supposedly with x-ray vision going to see what my rig weighs and immediately arrest me on the spot. That's myth number two. So I've answered a number of people on the site but then I finally went to Steve and I said, the right way to do this, the proper way a journalist does this, is to research the question and have real experts weigh in. So, Stephen has been in touch with the Ontario Provincial Police to talk to them about the actual legal aspect of what is legal and what is illegal in terms of a truck and trailer what it weighs, what happens on the road, and quite honestly, he simply came out and said the most important thing is, how concerned are cops with recreational haulers? Now, we're not about to answer these questions at the moment. I just want to give you a preview on what we've been up to. Now, he's been working on that aspect of it. What I've been working on is I got together with some people at the insurance companies. And specifically, here in Ontario, there is a company which specializes in insurance for recreational vehicles. So who better to talk to? So I have actually been talking to the, uh, the head claims adjuster, as well as a vice president, and ask them that question, okay? Um, a brand new claim comes in, there's been an accident, explain to me what you guys look 
for and explain whether or not what the rig weighs has any bearing on whether or not you will deny coverage. So again, I'm not going to give you that answer right now. I just want you to know that we're trying to go about this the right way, get the information from the people that know, and then we are going to put together a video to try to dispel some of these myths. Absolutely. So that not only can everybody out there feel better about their rig, um, but ultimately we, we have the right information and we're not driving down the road thinking that A, the cops are looking to bust us and B, the insurance is looking to screw us, which they're not. Yeah, okay. no, I can't add much to that besides yeah. to say watch out for it. We have been working hard on it and um, it is a contentious issue and there's a lot of opinions and so that's what Dad's saying is that's why we did our best to go to the source to clear up Get all the, the he said, she said. One time my cousin's brother's uncle got pulled over and went to jail because he was overloaded. Yeah. We've heard so many of those stories, we're his. but so few actual firsthand accounts of any of this ever happening. So, again, yeah. we're not diving into it too deep now. but No, but I just wanted to get it out there because um, it's been really top of mind for me recently. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... No, uh, it's a good topic to cover. I mean, I remember, I forget, I think it was and you and I driving down the Highway 400 here in Ontario one time, watching a guy pulling a tri-axle, probably about a 30 or 40 foot boat with a Ford Explorer, and the front tires were in the damn like air. Almost off the ground. Almost yeah. off the ground. Exactly. And I was like, that's the guy that they're going to pull over. Me with an extra, you know, 800 pounds over payload and 1,000 in the trailer, they're not looking at me. Yeah, totally fair. And actually, just payloads in general, we'll dive into GVWRs, classifications of trucks, because that all comes up in that conversation as well. So exactly. It is a sticky uh, situation well, with a the lot there. Keep, keep payload on top of mind, because we got one good question here. It's in the middle. I will backtrack to everybody else. Yeah, please. Uh, Liam Robinson, thanks for join, joining us. You've been yeah, hey, uh, Liam. very every Hi, week Liam. with us. Given that the new Tacoma seems to have a bigger payload than the Tundra in a lot of its trims, are we getting back towards the compact half-ton truck? It's an interesting question, and actually I'll, I'll relate back to what Dad said earlier, which is that these trucks in worldwide markets have huge payload numbers because the midsizers are their only trucks. Now, I know it's the Hilux and other places, not the Tacoma, but... They could absolutely have bigger payloads. The manufacturers aren't stupid. They don't want the midsizers to start eating into the half tons. So I'm sure those numbers are played with to make sure that you're not going out and saying, well, the midsize has got way more payload. Now, to what your point is saying that Tacoma has more than some Tundras, I don't think we're getting back to the point of what you'd call a heavy midsize truck. I think that's probably just a happy accident by Toyota. <laughs> there are there are some peculiarities, and you got to wrap your head around the fact that uh, a lot of the numbers, particularly payload numbers that the manufacturers <coughs> stick on a certain vehicle, have more to do with the classification of that vehicle, meaning that they can't go over a certain number because of how they're classified with the government. Not because the weight isn't there, not because they can't handle it, simply because on paper you can't have any more. So uh, that also plays into some of the other stuff we're talking about. For sure. Yeah, but I don't expect a rash of midsizers to suddenly get epic payload numbers, no. I guess is the point. Cause, no. Because they would be shooting themselves in the foot, and they know that. The, the, fact, that they, the fact that they do overlap, though, is, is interesting stuff. Sure. Because like, if you're that guy and you need that number, you look at it and go, well, I could maybe save a few bucks and get the slightly smaller truck, and it will still perform as much as this truck will. Sure. Which is interesting. But it also is obviously so trim specific because we just had that Ram Limited Elite that's got a thousand pounds of payload. We had a Sierra AT4X AEV edition, a thousand pounds of payload. So those trucks, a bunch of midsize trucks blow them out of the water, but yeah. of course they're high trim trucks. So it's also, you got to look specifically at what Trade trims off. you're comparing, right? Yeah. Alrighty. Um, I got two questions that kind of relate to each other. And one of them is for, again, from Sam who donated to us tonight. Thanks, Sam. Well, him uh, will answer. Sam Absolutely. asks, what do you guys think of the Hurricane engine, and when we will when will we see it in the Ram lineup? And that same question ties into a, for the first question we got tonight. Have we heard anything about the Jeep Gladiator powertrain? I think these two things will tie in together nicely. Sure. I can't believe the i6 Hurricane isn't in the Ram yet. I don't know what they're waiting for. We know it's coming. Yeah. Like, just give it to us already. I don't know if it's production, if they're just waiting until 2024 model year. I don't know. I don't. Is the short answer. I, I'm. I'm personally surprised it's not here yet. But um, in in typical 
Stellantis fashion, I'm sure once it is here, they'll start jamming it in everything. Yeah. From your lawnmower well, to your minivan. Totally. And that's it, right? It went in Wagoneer first, and then it's going to spread across the lineup. <coughs> As Sorry. for Gladiator, the short answer on that is also no. We haven't heard a lot about a Gladiator update. We've been hearing rumblings about a Dakota forever now, but it seems like if the Rampage comes, that might you know, Kill the Dakota stop rumor. the Dakota rumor. Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't do Dakota if I brought Rampage. Yeah, you unless, know. Unless they just rename it for North America. So then eventually Gladiator will get updated, but the only updates I see coming to Gladiator anytime soon are all the updates we just got on Wrangler, right, for 2024, because those were significant updates. Sure. The full float rear axles and the higher towing and et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think we'll get much more than that on Gladiator, though. I don't expect them to suddenly come out with some new power change. If you want to see where a certain model is going, sometimes the best thing to do is look up what their sales are doing. Mm. And if you've got a model that is selling, as is, really well, despite the fact that they've got, say, new development, engine, something else, engineering in the wings, those are a bunch of guys sitting in a room going, you know what, we're going to hold off on this right now. What the hell? We're selling every one we built just yeah. the way it is. We'll just save that for later. So it, it doesn't always come down to, you know, is it a real production issue or something? No. Sometimes it's just a money issue. Yeah. And they just spent all their time and money on Wrangler, right? So I'm sure when now that that's done, then maybe we'll turn their attention to Gladiator. But they were just real busy with Wrangler, and that's their true baby. You cannot screw up the Without Wrangler, a doubt. So. And, and Gladiator's selling well just the way it is. It is. That is true. Okay. Uh, I think we answered this, but I'll just ask it anyway. Derek asked, is the Rampage Fiat-based? Or is it Jeep? It was Jeep-based. It was. It, I read that it shares its underpinnings with the Jeep Compass, okay. although I think the Compass is a Fiat Toro. I, I want to say it's called the Toro. I could be wrong about that. It's yeah. a big incestuous it. all, family. Yeah, it's hard to, you know, one thing is all based on Fiat. Once Fiat moved in there, you know, it all ends up blending. Into one another. So it's yeah. hard to say whether it's more Jeep or more Fiat. Okay. <laughs> Um, can you guys explain fleet efficiency rules and why they forced Toyota to dump a wonderful V8 while Ford, GM, and Ram are able to keep theirs, if not two? Yeah, that's, I mean, I can't explain it in total details just because the details are very, very deep. And our rules in Canada are not the same as the United States either. They've, they've that's also, also true. Canada and the States on. are different. That is fair. I don't think Toyota had to dump the V8, I think is the first thing I want to say. I don't think they were forced to, especially Toyota, because they sell so many hybrids. That offsets how many gas-guzzling V8s yeah. you can sell. Um, the early days, and I'm sure this is probably still the same, Stellantis, it was a credit system in the United States they came up with. So if you were selling a ton of gas-guzzling V8s, you had to buy credits from companies who were selling a lot of electric vehicles, Tesla famously only made money for the first couple of years because they sold all their credits to Stellantis because mm. Stellantis wasn't building anything electric. Yeah. So they had to pay off these carbon credits back to the government um, and, and make that up. So, again, coming back to Toyota, I don't think they probably had to. I think Toyota is one of the most forward-looking brands. Yeah, that's and it. they just saw the writing on the wall. And they're actually willing to go, I know this is selling today. But whatever, we're going to pull the plug because we need to get ready for the future. Whereas Stellantis is like, let's sell every dang Hellcat we can until the last possible second. Because yeah. they're just, they're, it's so successful that they have a different strategy. <laughs> yeah, we, we know the Dodge is going to be the last rat off the ship. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. The last one off the VH <laughs> ship. So I guess that's the point. I don't think Toyota has necessarily been forced yet. All brands are being forced to bring up their fleet average fuel economy. Right. Yeah, uh, we, we have targets to hit by what was it, twenty twenty five? The targets step up. Every they step up every year. Years. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, and that's the other thing too. So yeah, he's saying Ford, GM, Ram keep their V eight. So Ford still has the five liter that you can now get with seven hundred horsepower, uh -huh. and then they have the Lightning, instant offset. <laughs> that is as it. far as your average goes. Yeah, that is exactly it. So they're they're offsetting it with some of the electric stuff, yeah. and then I'm sure that some of those companies are still purchasing those credits behind the scenes. Well, they are. Yeah. I mean, so long as the math works out, and you know what accountants are like, it's just a lot of voodoo. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right. Every every live show, I always have to shout out. Hi, Ron. Thanks for watching, buddy. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. And uh, Ron says that his dad had a white '83 Rampage. So nice. Oh my very, goodness! He is really? very familiar. He says it's a wow. two, it was a 2.2 liter. Yeah. Uh, front front wheel drive, I think he yeah, says here. Yeah. Drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Super, super cool. That's funny, too. I'm always, you know, as a somewhat young man, I'm always surprised that at, there's new trucks come out, like the Hyundai Santa Cruz and the Ridgeline, and everyone's like, front-wheel drive trucks! We'll never accept this! We'll never do this! I can't believe you did yeah. it! And then you go, yeah, there's been a bunch of front-wheel drive trucks. This is not something new all of a sudden that we've done. All old ideas come back again, and then we get up, you know, get all mad about it. Yeah. And then, I don't know, personally, I'm always just interested to look back in history and be like, oh, crap, this has all been done Engineering before. goes in waves, as I always like to freak out my sons here when I tell them, when people rant about unibody trucks, that from 1960 to 1963, Ford built the F-100 as a unibody. Yeah, yeah, they all tried different things. I was really impressed. I wish I could remember the make and model now, but I was just at this automotive museum, and this car was from the 30s, and it had headlights that turned with the steering wheel. It was yep. this incredible incredible mechanical connection, but the same thing. I'm always just like, oh, well, that's like a luxury feature, or this cool new futuristic feature. It's like, no, we've oh, had it forever. No, I drove, I drove, I drove, same thing with the Tucker. Yeah. yeah. 48. I drove a 1961 Chrysler Imperial, and when you open the door and hit a button, the driver's seat pivoted and slid out so you could just step out yep, of the car that's right, right. i remember 61 cadillac had that too yeah oh, that's really so i mean cool. it's not nothing new <laughs> nothing new <laughs> we're getting off base now but yeah oh, hey, no, it's okay it's okay old ideas come back around again <laughs> like front wheel <laughs> drive trucks um well two people have asked about them so i think we can talk about them uh we talked a lot about the oh my goodness i was supposed to say mid-sized truck what compact. Are we compact compact thank you yes. jesus we talked a lot about compact trucks tonight and what's coming so a couple people have asked about Volkswagen and have asked about Toyota. And we keep seeing a lot of rumors about, and now I know I'm not wrong after last show, right. the yeah. Stout. Yeah. I just assumed everybody was Stout. spelling it wrong. And the Scout. Yeah, and then Volkswagen has been teasing <clears throat> the Am Amarok, I believe. Well, the Amarok is, that's more of a midsize truck. Okay, I think okay. the Stout's going to be even smaller than that. No, okay. part, yeah, Scout. So, Scout. so that's it. This is and, tough. And the, the electric version yes. yes the scout is the you know reimagining of the scout brand that everyone already knows about right and it's going to come back with a small electric suv and compact it's, truck it, right. but it, it's going to be the international scout owned by volkswagen i don't know if internet well it, it is because, volkswagen, yeah, 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 because volkswagen owns international, international. yeah so what's left of it i imagine the through their heavy truck division yeah and then they own that name. And, and I imagine, I mean, Americans, cover your ears real quick. I imagine that they'll try to Americanize that truck by using that brand name. Yeah. You know, rather than just saying, here's a Volkswagen truck, they're going to say, it's an international. We brought it back. Well, yeah. I don't think they'll <laughs> use the international, but they definitely get to use the Scout name. Yes, but that's it. From VW, it'll be Scout. That thing will be off-road focused, which is cool. That was always the whole thing with yeah. Scout, and they already said that. Uh, but it'll also be all electric. They've also said that. So I wouldn't expect a compact gas-powered Volkswagen. From Toyota, yes, we have the Stout. That is S-T-O-U-T. S-T-O-U-T. <laughs> Stout, um, which is a name that they're also bringing back. I didn't know this, but back in 1964, they sold the Toyota Stout. And now they're going to bring it back. At least they say they're going to bring it back. We haven't seen any confirmation of this by any means. But there's a lot of rumors on the internet, and usually where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. And so it makes sense that Toyota would jump back into this market, too. I can see by 2025, we're going to have three, four, five competitors in the compact truck market. Yeah, I think that's where we're going. And, you know, thank you, Ford, for making the F-150 a freaking behemoth. So big. <laughs> because that's, this, is, this is what has spawned. Well, everybody else followed suit. But sure. this is what has spawned these smaller trucks now. Because the regular, what we still call half tons for no particular reason, they got huge. They just yeah. got absolutely huge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they just keep getting bigger. That seems to be the answer every time they redesign. Is people wanted more power, more towing, so we made it bigger, <laughs> more rear seat space. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, not more even... cup holders. Yeah, <laughs> that's the actual truth. More space for my family and more cup holders. That's yep. why the trucks got so dang big. <laughs> um, we get this question every couple of months, and Dad, you usually have the best answer for it. How would you guys feel about more diesel engines in the United States and Canada? Most countries have more options. Why don't we? Yeah. That is a uh, another big topic. Look at it. It's it's a complicated question. Um, however, I can boil it down into something very simple. Um, the government in North America does not like diesel. Period. That's fair. Okay. Electric is the darling. If you go to Washington or Ottawa, it's always Washington. 
and say, I've got this great <coughs> idea for something electric. They go, here, here's lots of money. Have a good time. You go down and say, I've got a 1.2 liter turbo diesel engine that puts out 7,000 horsepower and runs on a teaspoon of fuel. They go, diesel, get out of here. We don't want your stinky <laughs> diesel. And this is what's going on in the world today. Because in the rest of the world, they're not stupid. I mean, diesel runs longer, easier to work on, very fuel efficient. Small diesel is a great way to go. There's lots and lots of vehicles running around with like 1.2 liter, 1.4 liter diesel engines. Totally. Um, but here, yeah, it's just not what we do. It's not part of the culture. It is also not cool right now. So the companies themselves let's let, let, look at the small diesels that gm had that ford had i mean they just they dropped them were they bad no they weren't bad they're just out of fashion and sadly that's the reality yeah and then if i can just add our personal feelings especially on that colorado i loved the baby that was a great in the colorado Duramax, yeah that was a great engine ran well towed super well so yeah no we're all for diesels but you know what, Dad said it. Not only did Volkswagen deal with Dieselgate, uh, but then but then Ram dealt with their three-liter issues, and their issues were even more complicated because they didn't really do anything illegal, but the government kind of thought they did, and it ended up just being a big cluster. So any other company, all they had to do was look over the fence and go, "I don't want to do what they're doing right now," and I don't want to deal with the fact that everybody's just watching us. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. Mr. Mr. Newfoundland Ken Howard for Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> we could care. Uh, uh, I wouldn't last a day before they impeached me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, one was back here. Uh, any any rumblings about a Subaru Baja? Uh, I don't uh, think so. You know what? They tried. It flopped. I don't see them trying it again. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't see it either. As fun as it might be. The Santa Cruz, I think, is as close as we're going to get. Yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, uh, we haven't really talked too much about Santa Cruz, but I just saw something that the numbers have been kind of disappointing for them. So I think maybe they, they shot themselves in the foot trying to go with the sports you know, version of that and going strictly kind of high-end. Yeah, and not kind of treating it more as a truck really right yeah and and to. as and as a cheaper entry level thing yeah. you know that's where that's where ford you know nailed it right yeah cheap man hybrid and hybrid being the uh the, the entry model. level the entry level base model yeah, right yeah they nailed it yep. so yeah anyway uh subaru there was the same problem yep quite honestly it was a great little great little vehicle but it was it was it was pricey <laughs> um steve sarah tuned in i did see that and yeah i noticed she saw that so she I, says don't want to try Flat out. And then so, I also saw she, she mentioned she would had some research paralysis. And, I mean, I feel you because I spent a half an hour looking up all that stuff, too. It gets overwhelming with all the numbers, yeah. trying to find, the, even just trying to find the correct numbers. And I do this for a living, so I know exactly where to go. If you don't know exactly where to go, it can take you a while, right? So, anyways, I hope the information helped you. Thanks for tuning in. And, yes, Thanks for asking. this whole episode will be available after. You can watch it as many times as you want and hit pause because I know I talk fast. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, well, Damien, he, he just made a statement, and I think this actually ties in with something we've got coming up. It's a little early for that, but uh, the new Lexus GX comes out tomorrow. Right, and tonight, I'm pretty, actually. Tonight, and I'm pretty sure we are seeing what we think is Land Cruiser in a couple weeks. Uh, yes, yeah, so so it's still a rumor. I don't yes. think it's a what great... What we think is. A strong rumor. Yeah, we haven't been told, but... We're going, where are we going? We're going uh, Salt Lake City. We're going to Salt Lake to see something. Yeah. So it must be something if they're taking us out to Salt Lake. And a lot of people say it's going to be a rebirth <coughs> Land Cruiser, which will be related to this new Lexus GX that we're just about to see. Yeah. Um, which I'm all very interested in. I'm surprised. Because I am also surprised if they do bring back Land Cruiser, where it fits in with Sequoia and Forerunner. Is it still top of the line luxury? Is it more off-roady? How big is it? Yeah, I'm interested. To Toyota, see that Toyota's thing. SUV strategy is bonkers. And it has been for a few for a decade. Now, what do yeah. you mean by that, Matthew? I mean that they have way too many that overlap <laughs> with each other and don't make any sense. Yeah. And then all of a sudden totally. you're like, oh, here's a new car, and here's an SUV version of it. <laughs> why, guys? We already like. Why did I need a Corolla Cross when I already had a Venza that's the same damn size? Well, and then they brought the Crown too. I remember looking at the Crown, going, "Isn't that just a Corolla Cross?" <laughs> and, and for what I'm going to spend on the Crown, there's the Lexus sitting right there with the yeah. equivalent model. I just 
the, the SUV strategy is bonkers and makes no sense. Well, let's wait until we see it. And uh, yeah, yeah, but okay. yes, Lexus GX and TX, I believe, are yeah, both two being products. unveiled tonight. Yes, at 8 p.m. Eastern in 10 minutes, so you guys can watch that. Not on, on that won't be on trucking, but you'll see it all over YouTube. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Alex, Alex says, "Good luck on that video, guys. Social media is a cesspool of information." I he saw says, that. "But if you could add some information on triple towing, I, I actually I'd like to know more about triple towing myself and just understand the legality well, behind it because I know you well, can do it in Ontario. It's uh, legal in Ontario. Actually, I think it's legal in about in about nine provinces. But that's the question: is you know, legal is one thing, but what's the legality involved? How heavy can my third trailer be?" Compared to my second trailer, does that matter? Well, the I'll say weights? I'll say this to you, Mister. I like to do research. It's all in the Highway Traffic Act. All right. it's, it's all there. And it's all available online. It Look it up. Painful documentary. Oh, yeah, it is. I was it's, in the Highway you, Traffic you, Act this you, week. You got to try to find the right section. If you find the right section, you're good. Yeah. Um, but you gotta you gotta sort of power through it. Yeah. So and besides, you know what? Triples are fine. You just can't back them up. <laughs> All right, no yeah. more than like you know ten feet sure, yeah, it's before they right. start both going wonky on you. Yeah. So just make sure you never have to back it up. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can include that in that video for sure. Well, this is here. This is a great question for Steve. Yeah. I bet most people that drive minivans and three row SUVs end up being way over payload when going on road trips. Oh God, I, man! Yeah. I've been harping on this now for so long. I think half the vehicles I see on the road are over payload. It's easy to get over your payload with yep. just people and stuff in a vehicle. I don't think most folks look at the sticker on their door or really Never. consider those not, numbers. Not when it comes to people. They're like, well, I got four seats. I'm going to put four people hey, in. Precisely. Or I got seven seats. I'll put seven people in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, no, I couldn't agree with more with you. And, and that's where I'm actually getting back to with this whole payload conversation is if the police... Our, or DOT or MOT are very concerned with over payload, they should be pulling over half the vehicles on the highway. <laughs> half of them! Yeah. Like, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Yeah. And so then when I talked to the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police, I brought that up. And, and again, I don't want to spoil it all, but that was part of my issue with the whole payload thing. Everyone's saying, if you're over payload, you're illegal. So then a lot of us are illegal. Is that what you're telling me? And I just didn't buy that. So, so yes, to answer your question, you are correct. Most SUVs, minivans, even small cars, easy to go over the payload. Yep. Yep. Um, well, Ron just said maybe Mazda should build, start building the B2000s and 2200s again. Yes. Hey, I, I, I still got an 86 out in the back 40. Now, of course, it was, so was yours a Ranger in 86, or was that, because Mazda built that truck before Ford and Mazda got together, and then they built basically just a Ranger. And it was just a Ranger with a B4000? Yeah. B4000. I think it was the B4000 was the Ranger. But I think in 86, Ranger. your truck was, like, I'm just a Mazda. It was just the Mazda. It was before the Ford. Yes. Which is even cooler. And that's why Mazda needs to come back and just build a Mazda-built pickup truck. That was a great little Based truck. it on that CX-90. Oof. Yeah. Yep. It's rear wheel drive. Yep. And then uh, JC asks, and I think I know the answer to this one, but why is the AT4X so expensive? And is, is it not just a ZR2, basically? Correct. Yeah. You, you, you do got all the good off-road, you know, goodies in there. You know, the lockers and the suspension and the lift and the tires. And yeah. So they add a lot of money. And then don't forget that if they have a chance to slap on some more profit, they're going to do it. Yeah, I, I have two quick answers for that. The first one is the market, period. If other brands are charging it and they can charge it, they're going to charge it. But B, it's a GMC. And more than ever, we feel like GMC is trying to set itself above Chevrolet, clearly above Chevrolet. So when you go GMC, there's a bit of money baked in there strictly because it's the GMC. So, you know, if you're looking for value, stick with the Chevy, I would say. Yeah, they definitely want to be the premium brand. Exactly. All right, well, talking off, talk, oh, what did I just do there? There we go. Talking uh, off-road and value, Steve. Yeah. Riders just asked, what did you think of the Ineos Grenadier? Oh, yeah, good question. So we just, well, I just drove the Ineos Grenadier uh, last week. I wasn't invited. <laughs> for you guys that don't know, Ineos is a British company started by uh, Sir James Ratcliffe 
who also started Ineos Chemicals. I didn't know very much about this. Yeah. I just learned about it too. The, but they're a massive, massive company, worldwide company. Um, the, the story kind of goes that when the Defender went out of production at Landover, Sir Jim Latcliffe basically said, I don't like that. I want a Defender. So he went out and built his own. Uh, so the Grenadier uses a BMW 3-liter twin-turbo V6. It's got solid axles, a ladder frame, lockers in the front and back, a snorkel, um, all kinds of, of really serious off-road equipment. And it, it feels like it feels like a purpose-built off-road vehicle. I only had the chance to ride in it off-road for maybe half an hour. I did get to drive it. Um, and it, it, it performed excellently. I guess here's my issues with it. Is that in Canada it costs 91000 to start. In the States it's seventy six, if my memory serves correct. So it's, it's kind of expensive. And it's it's pretty sparse. Like it's not a really luxurious feeling vehicle, like a G Wagon or a Defender. It's much more utilitarian. So at the price point, it's a specific buyer who wants that. Because at those prices, most of those buyers want luxury. They want leather and comfort and something massaging them, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you're the guy who wants something more hardcore off-road and you don't care about the luxury and you're willing to spend the money, this hits that mark. Um, and with all that being said, the next big question is, how's it going to do in North America? And I, I don't really know yet. I feel like it's too expensive, but maybe the market will say, hey, you know what? This is now the cool thing, cooler than a G-Wagon, and I just have to get one. So I, it depends how much, It depends it's how many they think they're going to sell. It's always going to be a niche vehicle. Sure, absolutely. Always. Yeah. Even it if it goes huge, it'll still be niche. <laughs> For sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was cool. It was fun to drive it. Uh, go check out the video on the channel. You can get a bit more information on it. Um, and sorry, the last thing I did want to say, because I think this is important. I didn't get to this in the review either. They are building brick and mortar dealerships. They're not going to latch on to someone else. They're not going to you know, have some kind of weird strategy there. They're going to have real Ineos standalone dealerships. So you have a service bay to go to. You have a tech there. I thought that was important too. You don't want a new brand to show up. And then when you say, hey, where do I bring my car for service? And they go, well, take it down to Joe's garage. He's licensed. Like, you just, yeah. you don't want that. That's we'll, cool. we'll, we'll see. Honestly, particularly in Canada. In the States, maybe. But in Canada, come on. You're trying to tell me they're going to have a standalone? Maybe one. One. Yeah. One, one in the country. They, in they've Toronto. currently announced or Toronto Vancouver. and Vancouver. Yeah. Of okay. course. Okay. All right. So, yeah. yes, they've only announced two. Okay. I don't expect yeah. a lot. Yeah. No. Even That's right. Still. Grand Prairie, sorry, you're not getting one. Well, yes, absolutely. Saskatoon, it's not happening. Sorry, sorry guys, guys in Alberta trying to pronounce Ineos would be fun to watch. <laughs> oh, oh, come on, that wasn't nice. <laughs> not nice. Uh, Mr. Doug Sage donated five bucks. Thank hey, you very thanks, much. Hey, Doug. Appreciate it. I appreciate you, man. the little dancing pair. If you have a question, by all means ask, and we will get to you. Yeah, and to everyone else watching, if you got a couple bucks, we can always use it. Gas prices are expensive. Oh, my goodness. These <laughs> videos aren't cheap, and I promise you that any money you give us is funneled right back into making the best possible right. videos we can and if we haven't already told you steve's got three kids count them <laughs> three and his, his minivan is broke oh no so i need a new tripod <laughs> his, steve's minivan is always over payload always <laughs> just in just in lost cheerio <laughs> got it um did ram discontinue the mega cab i think so i haven't seen it in a while <sighs> we argued about this the other day remember yeah and yeah. while Steve's so doing that, let, um, let's have an actual look because I'm like, no, it's still okay, there. Hold on. While Steve's doing that, Sam, you asked if you said you still can't purchase a TK ball cap. Um, we don't do the restocks. That is actually through YouTube, um, sponsored by what's the company that actually does the printing for us? Um, I don't even know to be honest. YouTube, 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 and Google set it all up, basically, man. Yeah. So if they're out of stock, I'm sorry. Uh, we can reach out to them and see what's going on, but. As it stands, that's out of our hands. And as soon as they're in stock, we'll let you know. Yeah, we are. For anyone who's seen the... If you've watched any of our videos recently, you've seen we're selling those giddy-up straps. Uh, with that business, we are looking now to make an online store, maybe sell some stuff ourselves. Because like Matt just said, we have no control over the YouTube merch. Yeah, we so, don't particularly care for that. And it's not the best stuff either. So we want to actually get our fingers in there and do more for you. So watch uh, in the... Not too distant future. We yeah. just, like so many things, you just got to find the time. So on the Mega Cab, and this is the way I thought it was, it is not discontinued on the 2500, but there is no more 1500 Mega Cab. Well, there okay, you go. Fair. I'm about 95% on that. It's definitely still there you, in the you HDs. see it in the builder? In the HDs, it's here. Okay. Yeah, the 1500 Mega Cab, I don't think is the thing. 
Okay. okay. There you go. So that's so, our answer. Split decision. Yep. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, well, we're getting down to the end of it, so I think we're going to take one more, and I actually, I actually like this question. Do you think that the new Toyota Tacoma will be dethroned, and which midsize truck would each of you pick today? Mm. Man, so the first answer is no. <laughs> it, the, the, and I always come back to this. The, the Ford Ranger sold 92,000-ish units. The Tacoma last year, Tacoma sold over 200,000, more than double the next truck. Like, the lead is just so commanding that for someone to try and come in and take over, I, I do not see it happening. If anyone's going to do it, and it's almost just because they have an advantage, it'll be the GM twins, strictly because you can add together Chevy and GMC, yeah. and they get that magic number that they love to tout. However, but I don't see one nameplate ever displacing that's Tacoma. That's going to be down the road. Now, one thing that you do need to know is that in any automotive company, there has to be uh, a champion. If you want to if you, if you do something like that, there has to be a guy there, or a woman, who says, we will have the premier off-roader. And interestingly enough, when we were recently out at the GMC Canyon uh, intro for ATX... AT4X. AT4X. Why can't they make that shorter? Too many letters yeah. and numbers. GM is the worst. They ever. kept repeating over and over during their presentations, we want this to be the foremost midsize off-roader. So afterwards, I did go and I went, you realize that you're straight up, you know, challenging Toyota. And they're like, yes, we are. So that's where it's coming from. But it ain't happening this year or next year or the year after. But if they're willing to keep pushing that agenda, talk to us again in about five years. Yeah, I guess you're right. Although it's a tough thing because it's, it's the exact same situation with F-150. I feel like being the best-selling truck obviously helps you to be the best-selling truck, right? Like, that branding just builds up snowballs and goes... Because it does. It continues to roll. There's yeah. a million reasons why you shouldn't buy a Tacoma or an F-150 for, you know, over other trucks. And we've said them on the channel a ton of times. So it's not like those trucks are the best in every application, but that doesn't matter. When they're the best-selling, that thing just, yeah, it snowballs. So I think that's also part of what mm -hmm. we're looking at here, and... And Tacoma's reputation for reliability, warranted or not, is out there. It is cemented well, and, in people's and, and brains. And resale, but the resale is real. Yeah, you're the right. resale, resale alone is, is crazy. You're right. So, yeah, you know what? Um, if, if there's one interesting sort of side note to this is that the competition for that crown in the midsize segment is heating up. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it's already hot. And in, and in, you know, and in 2015... All the manufacturers said, we don't need mid-sizers. Yeah. And Toyota was the only one who stayed true to the course. And Nissan. And Nissan. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. Frontier never went away. Frontier never goes away. We just, we don't just, forget about the Frontier. Chug it, chug it, chug it, chug it, chug it, chug it, chug it. It was there. Yeah. It was there. I just kept forgetting about it. Don't hate. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we'll take, I'll take, this isn't even a question, it's just a statement. Yeah. Ron wants you to go get the Mazda running again out in the forest. He specifically addressed you. It'd be a good video. I'm yeah, sure you know what? Maybe on a nice <coughs> summer day when the bugs finally go down, it's we'll go back there. We'll chop down all the trees that are growing, growing up out through of the it. box. Yes. And throw a battery into it and see if she fires. You know what? It's been 15 years, but we remember we tried, We started it once. The throttle is currently stuck wide open, so it, had, it hadn't run in two or three years. I remember you and I, we, it was parked at the top of the hill, and we had to move it. So we got it running, it hadn't run in three years, and it just went, -na 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 -na, boom, -na 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 -na, right off the red line, right off the limiter. So that's the first problem to address. Well, it'll be, yeah, you know what? It's on, it's on the list. It's on the schedule, Ron. We'll get to it. It'll make for a great, uh, great video no matter how it turns out. Yeah, exactly. All right, and lastly, Sam says, what are your other plans? Long-term, short-term for the channel, and what's in the driveway? Great, yeah. channel. great question, Sam. Yeah, good question, and we're good getting close off. to the end, so exactly, it's yeah. a nice one to end on. Um, so we'll start with what's in the driveway. Uh, Dad and I, today, we just went and towed a 35-foot travel trailer with the Ford Lightning. So we've done towing with the Lightning, but we personally never pulled a travel trailer. So we wanted to see what that was like. We also wanted to investigate, hey, what's life like with an electric truck and a trailer for charging? What's life going to be like at the campground? So those are all questions we'll get into in that video. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. It was fun to go tow with it today. 
And then we also have a new Toyota Sequoia capstone in the driveway, which uh, we'll be releasing a video on coming up soon, too. Uh, and then what else? What do we got coming up? We got lots of stuff coming up. Well, we do have, I, I'll throw this one out there because this will actually be kind of a first. Uh, we've got a new Super Duty coming yeah. very soon. Um, one of the first ones in Canada. So we're, we're and the, the nice thing is, is that um, they're going to give it to us rather than us flying someplace and then, and then having to do whatever they tell us to do on their little course. They're going to give it to us for a week and, and we we're going to go, we're going to go do our stuff yeah. and tow our trailers. Um, so that'll be good. Yep. Super Duty is exciting. Uh, Jeep Wrangler. We just got an invite that uh, I'll be there driving the new 2024 Jeep Wrangler. That's mm -hmm. at the beginning of July. So that's exciting. Uh, and then Dad mentioned it. We're planning a pretty big kind of epic road trip video for August with the GMC Canyon AT4X. Yep. yep. We're going to go search out some Ontario ghost towns. Yeah. Oh, we're going to be a cool one. Do the overlanding thing, get out there on the trails, look for ghost towns, and, mm. uh, and highlight the, the GMCs along the way. So that's, yep. that's really exciting, and that'll kind of cap off the summer for us. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, let's not forget about TK Power Sports because yeah. it's busy over there, too. We've got a, a shed full of ATVs right now. We've got oh. five ATVs and a side-by-side. -side. I need a bigger barn. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if you guys didn't see it already, we just put up an epic five-way drag race it over was, on TK Power Sports. It was Sports. a fun drag race. If you want to watch me do a wheelie and almost hit Dad, <laughs> go watch that video. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> make sure you check out TK Power Sports. And we have individual reviews on all of those ATVs coming as well. So, lots of that. And some Wave Runners. We got Wave Runners coming this summer, too. Always like to get out on the are, water. Are we going to actually get all this done? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, man. Weird, weird timing with the end of the show. The Lexus GX embargo just lifted. What do you guys think? <laughs> I, I haven't looked at it. We've been sitting We're here. We're going to see. So, yeah, we're going to sign off so we can go it. look at it. I didn't dig into it either. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we definitely will. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's everything we've got coming up. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is we are bringing on a full-time video guy. So we are actually trying to expand. I, I right now do most all of the editing, and then Dad and Matthew and I share the shooting duties. And I, I keep getting fired. It's becoming too much. So we are bringing on a full-time video guy. If you notice an uptick in quality in some of the videos, that's because our friend Liam shot them. And this should allow us to just provide more content better content and on a better schedule so yes uh we have all these plans plus we're trying to bring you guys better stuff absolutely so perfect thank you for tuning in because that's the reason we do these things if we were just talking to ourselves then i wouldn't have to keep looking at these lights all night oh long. <laughs> did i have to plug the camera in i thought oh, i thought it was fun the way it fair <laughs> oh no so yeah thanks yeah. so much for tuning in guys we appreciate you come back for tk live uh, in two weeks take yeah. it easy see everybody enjoy this enjoy the forest fire smoke <laughs> that became a topic at the end here. <laughs>